Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Good morning, Great View friends. Thanks for joining us on uh, this Mother's Day here in May 2023. And the season of Easter is still with us. These weeks following the resurrection, as Jesus teaches his disciples and plain, explains all the things that he couldn't or they, they didn't understand before his death and resurrection. And the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection is something that takes explanation and reflection. Peter explained this all to the Jewish people at Pentecost in ways that made sense to them. Now, today we're going to leap forward a few years, perhaps 10 years or more, and the Apostle Paul arrives in Athens, one of the greatest cities in the ancient world. And Paul is going to explain Jesus in a completely different manner than Peter did. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. <laughs> so you're, you're ignorant of the very thing that you worship. <laughs> well, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So Paul is here in Athens, the birthplace of democracy, a center of philosophical discussion for hundreds of years. This was once the heart of a great empire. Now in Paul's day, it's part of the Roman Empire. And he's speaking in the Areopagus, uh, that level ground in the lower part of this picture. In the background is the, Acro uh, the Acropolis, the, the Parthenon is the big temple on the top that you see dedicated to the goddess Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom. Behind the temple is a 30-foot bronze statue of Athena dressed for battle. And the Areopagus itself was a place for debate and legal matters. A person could bring their case to the council of the Areopagus and have the wise men deliberate over a right course of action. And this is where Paul was invited to speak by a group of those philosophers to explain his strange teaching about Jesus and the resurrection. How does he start? He says, you people are very religious. <laughs> I congratulate you. As I wander around your city, I see that you folks will worship anything, anyone. I love your altar over there that says, to the unknown God. You'll even worship something about which you have no clue. Paul actually used the word ignorant right there. And then he says, now, let me describe for you the God whom you don't know. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he <laughs> needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So the God who made the whole world does not live in these temples built by your hands. <laughs> That's not a good way to start. But do you remember Stephen from last week? He said the exact same thing to the Jewish leaders. This temple here is not where God lives. The God I serve, Paul says, doesn't need anything from us. He is the one who gives us life and breath, everything. He carries on. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. 
So God always wanted relationship with us. For those who will seek him, they will find him. And then Paul makes a couple of quotes that kind of often slip by us when we read here. The first one is, in him we live and move and have our being. Now this is actually a line from a famous poem by Epimenides, who says in that poem that Zeus, he's the, the high god in Greek worship, Zeus is not dead, but is alive and present everywhere. And he makes this statement, in him we live and move and have our being. And then Paul quotes from another famous poet, we are his offspring. These Greek poets are saying, everyone knows that Zeus is present everywhere, <laughs> so much so that all of us are the offspring of God. Now, do you see what he just did there? Peter and Stephen, as we listen to their preaching messages, quoted from the Old Testament prophets to the Jewish people to explain Jesus. But Paul quotes from the ancient poems of the Greek people. These poems tell us that there is a God at work in the world and that God is not dead or ancient history. He's present now. So Paul uses their backstory, we might say. Paul concludes his speech uh, this way. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him, this man, from the dead. God is not present in anything made by human design or skill. God's going <laughs> to overlook that kind of ignorance. <laughs> Paul uses that word again. Now, Jesus, the one who God appointed, he is calling you to turn away from your present way of life. And the proof that you need to make this decision to turn away from these gods and turn to Jesus is the resurrection of Jesus. And that's where Paul ends his speech, right there. It tells us in Acts that some of the people sneered at his teaching and they just walked away. This is foolish. But some said, tell us more. And some eventually came to believe in Jesus and the resurrection. One of them was a guy named Dionysius, who was actually one of those wise men on the council of the Areopagus. People of Athens, I see that you are very religious. <laughs> what Paul meant was that the Athenians worshipped many gods and they were diligent in their religious practices. He could have said the same thing in Jerusalem because that was a city of very religious people. In the ancient world, and really in most parts of the world today, belief in a God and practicing the worship of that God go hand in hand. In other words, if you're spiritual, meaning that you believe in something beyond just the material world or the prove it in a test tube world. If you're spiritual, then you demonstrate your spirituality through religious practices that go along with what you say you believe. It's not just a, a personal preference. In other words, in the ancient world, in the Christian faith, and in most of the other world religions today in the world, you can't be spiritual without being religious. That's what spirituality and religion has meant for most of human history and in most of these various religious traditions around the world. But we live in a time and place 
where we hear repeatedly the exact opposite. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Well, what is meant basically by this is, well, I believe there's a spiritual dimension to life, but I don't need any religious practices to go along with that. It's kind of a, an interior sense of well-being. It's, it's personal. It's mine. It doesn't require any community of people where we pray and live out our faith together. It's just me and whatever spirit I believe in. That's what works for me. We might say that it's the ultimate form of personal selfishness. I can nurture my own spirituality within myself as I see fit. My idea of my spirituality is all that matters. Now this is kind of what Paul is getting at in Athens. I applaud your spiritual search. You're looking for answers. That's great. But you seem to have so many options to believe in, so many gods to worship, that in reality you're worshiping no one. It's all about you, <laughs> your perceptions based on your very finite experience. But what if one of these gods is true, real? And Paul says, now let me tell you about your unknown God. He's the one you've been missing. The one true God, Jesus, crucified and raised from the dead. So today we live in a time of ideology overload. Whether that's politicians, the news media, the social influencers, university professors, your elementary school teachers, or even just your neighbor down the street. Everyone has their own personal idea of how to live, who I am, who I want to be. Well, we might say, that's fine for them, let them do as they please. I'm okay, you're okay. But that's not exactly how it works, because to justify their personal self-centeredness, they then demand that we all do exactly what they have done come up with our own gods and personal self-expression. Now that's an ideology, something that goes beyond an idea. It's an idea about a total way of life that I believe everyone else should adopt because I feel justified in my own self. We see this on the left with their progressive personal spiritualities. But we also see this amongst conservative or people who call themselves Christians who want to make God into their patron saint for their own ideologies that they want to impose on other people. Today, many of these spiritual but not religious people don't want to hear from us about Jesus. Jesus has got a, a bad rap, as they say. There are so many options, otherwise, why do we even need to consider Jesus? Well, Paul recognized that in Athens. So many options. And he said here, let me tell you about Jesus. He is the one option you should be considering. So Paul wasn't afraid to declare Jesus, even in a marketplace full of God options at the heart of the philosophical universe, you might say, in Athens. Now, if you read in this story in Acts chapter 17, you'll notice that Paul had a very limited response to his message in Athens. When you consider all the other places where he spoke the gospel, the same story, and churches were birthed, we don't hear about that in Athens. <laughs> when everyone is able to make up a, a spiritual cocktail that suits them, <laughs> people don't want to hear about a crucified God. That's very much like our own times. But Paul is unapologetic. He's calling people to pay attention to the unknown God 
who looks like Jesus Christ. You want to know who God is? He looks and acts like Jesus. And he is not dead. He is the source of all life. Let me finish by taking us back to those Christians in Turkey that Peter has been writing to many years later. They were fearful of their situation as a minority group in their cities. They were feeling alone, hardly knowing what they should do to survive and strengthen their faith as Jesus' followers. Many Christians in Canada feel like that today. This is what Peter writes to them. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their own slander. We're not being physically threatened as Christians in Canada, as some are in other parts of the world today. But many of us have been mocked. We have been spoken to maliciously. We've been told that our views are archaic, they're unscientific. Your Christian beliefs are actually harming people. You Christians tell people that they should turn away from their own self-selected goals and instead revere or worship Jesus as their Lord and Master instead of themselves. You people are so regressive. That's archaic. <laughs> Here, Peter is saying, even if those comments and threats come, be eager to do good. Yes, we need to have thoughtful, biblically rooted answers for those who ask the question for the hope that we have. But we do this with gentleness and respect. So there's two things for us this morning. Are you eager to do good? What does that look like? How are you, how am I demonstrating what it means to do good? And secondly, are you prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you? To give the reason for the hope that you have found in Jesus? Are you prepared? So, you might be wondering, is this the right kind of message for Mother's Day? Well, I know this is a question that Christian mothers, Christian parents, have been asking me. How do I pass my faith in Jesus on to my children when they have so many other things being taught to them in the school system through the media? two things. Are you modeling for them what Christian character and goodness would do, would look like in your everyday life, in your home, in your school, your neighborhood? Your kids are watching how you handle everything. The faith in this sense is more caught than taught. The second thing, have you done your homework? <laughs> Are you prepared to help your kids understand how your Christian faith differs from the many different options that are being presented to them? And can you do that with gentleness and respect for those other people and their opinions? I love Paul's talk to the philosophers here in Athens. Paul could speak competently to the most learned scholars. He knew his stuff. He could talk with them about any topic they had. And he didn't force or impose or coerce his views upon them 
as an ideology. He simply offered them Jesus as the one they were searching for. You're looking for the unknown God, let me show you to him. In our service on Sunday, we're going to close with this song, I Speak Jesus. You can find it on our website here. And it's a song that says, in all of the circumstances, how do we find a way to speak the name of Jesus as the source of life, as the answer to what people are searching for? So, friends, I trust that this day, this week, you will go about doing good, even when it seems like nobody cares whether I do good or not. And I trust that you will continue to prepare and deepen your own understanding and ability to speak competently, be prepared to give an answer for those around us who have different perspectives. And that as we talk, as we communicate, we would do this with gentleness and respect. The Lord be with you, friends. Have a good day. Have a good week. We'll talk again.